Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And today we have a story that was suggested by Blake. So thank you, Blake. And apparently I know nothing about it. Yeah, Hannah's like, well, I know this story. I was like, nah, I didn't know it. Yeah, so I'm excited. (laughs) Uh, Just in case this stuff bothers you, I'll let you know that um, there's a couple places in the story where we talk about uh, somebody having suicidal thoughts. Okay. And also, two children were murdered. Got it. Mm-hmm. Understood. Okay. Uh, the book that I used for this one is called Sins of the Mother by Maria Eftiamatis. Oh, okay. I'm already uncomfortable <laughs> just from the title of that book. Yeah. All right. It's not good. All right. Well, hey, thanks, Blake, for suggesting this. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it seems that every story starts this way. It was a typical small town where everybody knows everyone. Okay. Union, South Carolina is called the City of Hospitality, and people say that life really revolves around family and religion. Boy, I really thought when you said it all starts this way that you were going to be like, Straight A student, everybody oh. <laughs> loves them. Pillar in the community. Their smile lightens up the room. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it's, yeah, no. Mm-mm. All right. It's quiet on Sundays, except for the trains that are passing through and the ringing of the church bells. The city and county of Union got its name from the old Union Church. The town was pre- previously known as Unionville, but it was later shortened to Union. The Union Church was home to three denominations, Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian, and okay. they all worshiped together at the same services. Oh, wow. All right. I thought that was like... That is pretty cool, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's great. There is a sign in Union that says, the city of hospitality. On the water tower, there's a painted image of two hands that are clasped together in a handshake, and it says, hospitality, a tradition. People make a difference. That's cool. Yeah. Susan Smith had grown up in Union and was born on September 26th, 1971. Her mother, Linda, was a homemaker and her father, Harry, was a firefighter. When Susan was a child, she was really smart and loved to learn. When she was six, her mom decided she wanted a divorce after 17 years of marriage. Now, Harry was devastated about the divorce, and he began drinking heavily at the local bar. Okay, well, I mean, understandable. <laughs> right. <laughs> that part is, however... Oh, no. Uh, five weeks after the divorce was actually finalized, he shot himself in the stomach. No! And many people actually believe that he didn't mean to kill himself. Oh. And was actually just looking for attention, so maybe Linda would take him back. Oh. And they think this because just moments after he pulled the trigger, he called for help, but it was too late. Okay. So. I mean, I definitely don't love calling it something for attention, but. Right. I and get. I mean, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, Maybe he was trying to do something a little different. Right. I, I have no idea. Yeah. Shortly after Harry's death, Linda married a wealthy man named Beverly Russell, and then she moved into his home with her kids. It seems obvious that Susan struggled tremendously with the death of her father. So she often listened to tapes of him laughing, and she kept a photo of him in the bottom of her desk drawer. Oh, I mean, she was so young, too. That's so sad. Yeah. And she still got good grades. In elementary school and junior high, but in high school, she actually excelled at everything. Oh, okay. She was a member of the Beta Club, which is a group for students with higher than a B average. And so not a bunch of fish. Got it. <laughs> right. <laughs> not a fish club. And as soon as you said Beta, I, I'm like, I knew, but I immediately was picturing little Betas. Oh, my. <laughs> um... <laughs> She was a member of the math, Spanish, and Red Cross clubs also. It's a lot of clubs. Yeah, a lot. She volunteered to help put on the city's annual Special Olympics competition. How the frick you got time? I don't know. And she also worked with the elderly. What? 
Yeah. Where did this girl get all this time, dude? I don't know. Holy crap. She was named president of the Junior Civitan Club, and her uh, her and her best friend Donna Garner worked as candy stripers at Wallace Thompson Hospital. Uh, okay. There's a Super lot going woman. on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then if you've never heard of the candy stripers, um, they are just volunteers at hospitals. In 1989, when Susan was a senior, she was voted friendliest female at Union High School. Her class. Classy, there it is. There, yep. <laughs> Oop, there it is. <laughs> Her classmates said she was cheerful, down to earth, and always smiled. Yes! Uh, it didn't light up the room. Too, oh, but, but it was close enough. <laughs> Uh, she often wore mini skirts and blouses to school, and a lot of the guys were really into her. Her outward appearance might have looked perfect to her classmates, but Susan was dealing with a lot. When she was 17, she showed up in the counselor's office at school to report that her stepfather, Beverly, had been molesting oh. her. Oh, no, I was hoping you were going to say that. Yeah. And the school, of course, was obligated to report this, but when the sheriff went to their home, both Susan and her mother said they would not be pressing charges. Interesting. There wasn't a court hearing, so a judge was presented with an agreement from Beverly's attorney, and then the judge sealed the records. That was it. That's very strange. Right. Susan began working at the local Winn-Dixie, and she moved up the ranks pretty quickly because she was just such a good employee. She started secretly dating an older man, and she was able to keep it a secret, but the guy was talking to people at the store about it, and um, he was married. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Eventually, she got pregnant, and this put her into a really deep depression. She did end up getting an abortion, and the relationship with the older man ended, and Susan was admitted to a medical center because she took an overdose of aspirin and anison. And what? Uh, it's like aspirin and caffeine. Caffeine. Okay, got it. Mm-hmm. Doctors found out that this was not the first time Susan had attempted suicide. She had done the same thing when she was 13 years old. Word of the suicide attempt spread through the town. and oh, Susan, small town. Yeah, small. And so she had to take a month off of school and work. When she went back to the Winn-Dixie, her friend David dumped his girlfriend and had a huge crush on Susan. He took her out on a date, and a year later, they were married. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. The marriage actually started out really rocky for the young couple, but it wasn't really their fault. David's brother, Danny, was really sick with Crohn's disease, uh, which in affects the gastrointestinal tract. Yep. And he had surgery, but the bacteria developed and uh -oh. he got worse. Just 11 days prior to the wedding, he died. Okay. Well, that is really unfortunate. Right. David's parents already had issues with their marriage and then it fell apart after their son died. In fact, Susan actually walked in on her father-in-law's attempted suicide, and she had to call for help. Holy shit. Yeah. So a lot's happening at really young ages here. Right, right. Because uh, Susan was only 19 when she got married. Holy shit. Okay. I can't even imagine. I know no. it happens. I, I just, I, like, I know it does, me, too, but oh. <laughs> that is such a different, like, maturity level than once you get further... Yeah, you know, down the line. So it's just, yeah, that's that's definitely young. It's bananas. So she's working part time at the Winn Dixie, taking college courses, and she got pregnant again. Oof. So the young couple had a lot of financial troubles, which makes sense. But that wasn't even their biggest problem. They went through a few separations where they were on a break. Yeah, okay, got it. Yep. <laughs> And so Susan rekindled things with a previous boyfriend. Oops. And so David began an affair with a cashier at Winn-Dixie in retaliation. What? Oh, my God. Ugh. No. Yeah. No. And Susan would then show up at Winn-Dixie 
with her son, and oh she would just be screaming at David in front of people. This is so unhealthy. Yeah, very big jealous scene here. If you're both having a fair, you know what? I'm I not know. getting into it. I'm not I getting know. into it. <laughs> well, during one of their attempts to work things out, Susan got pregnant again. Whoa, woman, fertile okay. myrtle over here. <laughs> she so. just muted not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now. Fertile Myrtle. <laughs> she's got two kids with David. Oh, boy. Oh, okay. On, you're going to love this. I knew. <laughs> okay. On their third anniversary, David gave Susan a card that said, quote, Hang in there, sugar booger. You mean everything to me. God, I love you. Wait, did he write that? That's yeah. amazing. Hang in there, sugar booger. <laughs> I'm so using that. <laughs> Sorry, Isaac. <laughs> oh, and to all my friends, you just became sugar boogers. Well, they broke things off four months later. Well, I don't care. My friends are still sugar boogers. Okay. <laughs> this goes out to all the sugar boogers. Hey, sugar boogers. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I'm shouting you guys out from now on. <laughs> By all accounts, early on, Susan appeared to be a good mother. When she took Michael for his first haircut, she brought a camcorder to film it. You know, because back then we didn't have cell phones. Right. <laughs> Wait, what? I know. We Whoa. didn't have cell phones? <laughs> and what, it, what? What did she use to record? That's this big boxy camcorder <laughs> that sits up on your shoulder. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, and then when he got a little bit fussy, she showered him in kisses. <laughs> okay. After the haircut, she knelt down and scooped all of Michael's hair into a small bag. Oh. She... I mean, I no, don't some know. parents do that. No, yeah. yeah, some parents totally do that. And then she also carried photos of her kids. And anytime somebody would ask how the kids were doing, she would pull out all the photos and show them off. That's amazing. Yes. Susan and David weren't like most couples when they broke up. Neither of them wanted to miss out on things. When the kids had like a doctor appointment, they both went. The boys were dropped off each day at daycare. And on Sundays, Susan took him to church. On September 21st, 1994, Susan's attorney served David with legal papers asking for the divorce on the grounds of adultery. In the complaint, it said, During the course of this marriage, defendant has carried on and continues to carry on an adulterous relationship with a paramour known to plaintiff. I'm sorry, did she not do the same thing? Yes. Okay. Due to this behavior and other irreconcilable differences, the parties here and separated and have continued to live apart. So Susan got full custody of Michael and Alex, and David got visitation rights, but he had to always give a 48 hours notice. People that knew the couple said the separation actually went pretty smooth. On the weekends, David picked up the boys and brought them over to his apartment. Susan got a job, a new one, as a secretary at Conzo Products Company, which is a company that manufactures decorative trimmings. Thank goodness you told me because I was just about to ask. <laughs> That's why I say Google all this <laughs> crap for you. <laughs> at work, Susan fell hard for another employee, Tom Finlay, and his father was the boss of the company. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Tom was really popular around town, and most women were interested in him. One of the locals said he was the most eligible bachelor. <laughs> Sorry. I just, I don't know. I thought that was kind of <laughs> funny. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't know who the most eligible bachelor in our town is. <laughs> I don't even know anybody in our town, so except for the people at the gas station. Mm-hmm. So true that, and the liquor store. That's about it. Okay, <laughs> I don't know anybody else. Yeah. So Tom and Susan began dating, but things fizzled out really quick. She seemed to be in love with him, but Tom felt that she was just too possessive and needy. 
And Tom actually wrote a letter to Susan, which causes a lot of people to wonder if this is the motive for her later actions. Okay. And I did cut a few pieces, well, a lot of pieces out of this letter that were irrelevant because it's so long. Okay. Uh, But I have a majority of it here. So he writes, Dear Susan, I hope you don't mind, but I think clearer when I'm typing. So this letter is being written on my computer. This is difficult for me to write because I know how much you think of me, and I want you to know that I'm flattered that you have such a high opinion of me. Susan, I value our friendship very much. You're one of the few people on earth that I feel I can tell anything. You're intelligent, beautiful, sensitive, understanding, and possess many other wonderful qualities that I and many other men appreciate. You will without a doubt make some lucky man a great wife. Even though you think we have much in common, we're vastly different. We've been raised in two totally different environments and therefore think totally different. That's not to say that I was raised better than you or vice versa. It just means that we come from two different backgrounds. Susan, I could really fall for you. You have so many endearing qualities about you, and I think that you're a terrific person. But like I told you before, there are some things that you uh, or sorry, there are some things about you that aren't suited for me. And yes, I'm speaking about your children. I'm sure that your kids are good kids, but it really wouldn't matter how good they may be. Fact is, I just don't want children. These feelings may change one day, but I doubt it. With all the crazy, mixed-up things that take place in the world today, I just don't have a desire to bring another life into it. And I don't want to be responsible for anyone else's children either. But I'm very thankful that there are people like you who are not selfish like I am and don't mind bearing the responsibility of children. If everyone thought the way I do, our species would eventually become extinct. But our differences go far beyond the children issue. We're just two totally different people, and eventually the differences would cause us to break up. But don't be discouraged. There's someone out there for you. In fact, it's probably someone that you may not know at this time or that you may know but wouldn't expect. Either way, before you settle down with anyone again, there's something you need to do. Susan, because you got pregnant and married at such an early age, you missed out on much of your youth. I mean, one minute you're a kid and the next minute you're having kids. Because I come from a place where everyone had the desire and the money to go to college, having the responsibility of children at such a young age is beyond my comprehension. Anyhow, my advice to you is to wait and be very choosy about your next relationship. I can see this may be a bit difficult for you because you're a bit boy crazy. But as the proverb states, good things come to those who wait. I'm not saying you shouldn't go and have a good time. In fact, I think you should do just that. Have a good time and capture some of that youth that you missed out on. But just don't get seriously involved with anyone until you've done the things in life that you want to do first. Then the rest will fall in place. Susan, I'm not mad about, at you about what happened this weekend. Actually, I'm thankful. As I told you, I was starting to let my heart warm up to the idea of us going out as more than just friends. But seeing you kiss another man put things back into perspective. I remembered how I hurt Laura and I won't have that happen again. And therefore, I can't let myself get close to you. We will always be friends, but our relationship will never go beyond that of friendship. And as for your relationship with, he puts, B. Brown... Of course, you have to make your own decisions in life, but remember, you have to live with the consequences also. Everyone's held accountable for their actions, and I would hate for people to perceive you as an unreputable person. If you want to catch a nice guy like me one day, you have to act like a nice girl. And you know nice girls don't sleep with married men. Besides, I want you to feel good about yourself, and I'm afraid that if you sleep with B. Brown or any other married man for that matter, you'll lose your self-respect. I know I did when we were messing around earlier this year, so please think about your actions before you do anything you'll regret. That's the end of the letter. But as we can see, she's messing around with more married men. Okay, first off, though, kudos to this dude for being completely honest. Yes. And being like, um, we're not doing this. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't want kids. That's understandable. I mean, to each their own. If he doesn't want kids, he doesn't want kids. Right. And saying, like, I don't want you to hate yourself, but, like, we can't be doing this shit. I don't want to be part of it. 
And I That's will completely say, understandable. Yeah, I saw like a lot of people trashing him and being like, how could you not want kids? Listen, um, it's not for everybody. Yeah. And I think it's better if you already know this isn't for me. Yes. Let's just stop this. And and that's the thing. A lot of the people that I have talked to that have told me they don't want kids have told me mm-hmm. years ago. And they've known that all along. Yeah. And if he is saying to her, like, that's totally understandable. That is 100,000% something you should absolutely not be trashed for because that is your opinion. Right. And so he likes her. He thinks she's great. Yeah. But the kid thing just isn't going to work for him. And he made that clear. He was yeah. like, you know, I could have seen myself falling for you. But to be honest, I don't want to be part of this. I don't want the kids. Like, I'm telling you, I'm being honest with you. I don't want to be in this relationship. Yeah. And I... now I'm seeing you also, you know, kissing the other dude. Mm-hmm. And, like, I don't want to be part of that. And, and again, even when he, like, was trying to tell her, like, you're, you're, you're doing shit you shouldn't be. Yeah. <laughs> he was still nice about it. I agree. And it was still, like, I want you to like yourself. And, like, that's just, that's really, kudos to this dude. Yeah, and honestly, like, there's so much more to the letter that I cut out. But he was basically telling her, like, I hope you go to college and get an education. Yeah. And then when you go to get a job, you know, my father can help you. And But they're saying that this is could possibly be one of the triggers to what happens in the future? Uh-huh. Wow. Okay. And you'll see, you know, when, when this all unfolds, yeah. how it makes sense. But I will tell you, this has nothing to do with him. Okay. I, he didn't do anything wrong. He he didn't know what her reaction was going to be. Right. And, and, and for sure, no. And I, like I said, that was, like, incredibly polite. And kudos to him for putting it out there. Yeah. And not just playing along with the relationship until he, like, you know, until they're too far in. And then he's just like, peace. Right. Or, like, another child is involved yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. No, I agree. So Susan received that letter four days after her divorce papers were filed in court with David, and it was just a few days prior to the murder. Oh, that was ominous. Yeah. she w- So she's in, like, a current state of rejection after rejection at this point. On October 24th, the night before the murders, Susan picked up her children and went to her best friend Donna Garner's house. Donna's parents babysat while Susan met with a professor at the University of South Carolina. Around 7.30, Susan and Donna stopped by the only bar that was in Union, and it's called Hickory Nuts. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Love that. Yes! (laughs) I would so drink there! Oh, yeah. It sounds like a great place. You can just tell. So when the two of them arrived, Susan saw that Tom Finlay was already there and he was talking to two women that he had known for a long time. There was nothing going on. They're both married women. He was just hanging out with friends. Got it. Tom was well known at the bar and stopped there about two to three times a week after work. Susan and Tom did not speak a word to each other, but he did tell the bartender to put Susan's and Donna's drinks on his tab. Wait, Tom is the... One that wrote the letter? That wrote the letter. Okay, just making sure. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So he pays for all their stuff, and then Susan never said anything to him, and they left. She went back to Donna's place to get her kids, and Donna's parents remember that she was acting, like, really normal, and she played with her boys and kissed and hugged them. It was just, you know, same old... Mm, Normal every day. Yeah, yeah. deal. The next day... Susan went to a Conzo staff lunch, and Tom and Susan sat next to each other, and coworkers and waitresses noticed that Susan was very quiet. Most people were talking and laughing, but she wasn't joining in, and she didn't really eat a lot either. They all returned to work around 1 p.m., and at 3.30, Susan told her supervisor that she had to leave early, and there were tears in her eyes. I don't like all this foreshadowing. Mm Mm-hmm. It's not good. Her supervisor did ask if she wanted to talk, and she said, no, maybe later. On October 25th, 1994, 23-year-old Susan Smith left the Conzo Products Company. She headed to the daycare to pick up her two boys, 3-year-old Michael and 14-month-old Alex. 
Michael's third birthday had just been two weeks earlier, and Alex had recently taken his first steps. Aww. Mm-hmm. On her way home, Susan was really in her head about this breakup, so she decided to stop at a local tavern. And she didn't go in. She didn't, like, go in and drink or anything. She sat in the lot and talked to a friend from work. She actually drove back to the office with her kids and was hoping that she could find Tom and work things out and get him back. But that didn't happen. Susan and her children arrived home about 6 p.m. They had pizza, and she called the tavern uh, Hickory Nuts (laughs) and... (laughs) Asked one of her friends if Tom was there (laughs) and also asked if he mentioned her by name. The friend said, yes, Tom was at the tavern, but he did not say anything about Susan. Around 7.30 to 8 p.m., she put the boys in their car seats in the back of her burgundy Mazda Protégé. And she thought that maybe a little drive might help to clear her head. And she says that she stopped by Walmart to do some shopping also. After she was done, she was going to a friend's house, but never made it. Let's start with the story she originally told. Okay. Why is it, like, changed drastically as we go? Oh, yeah. Okay. Susan said she was stopped at a traffic light and a black man broke into her car with a gun in his hand. The man tells her, drive or I'll kill you. She said she did what she was told and they drove east on Highway 49 and a gun was pressed against her while the two boys were crying in the back seat. After about 10 minutes, they reached the access road to John D. Long Lake. The man told Susan, stop the car and get out. She said she was frantically pleading for her children, but the man pushed her out of the car and drove off with her boys. She took off running to the nearest house crying. Shirley McLeod was in her house reading the Union Daily Times. It was a few minutes past nine and her husband Rick was on the couch watching TV and their son Rick Jr. was watching TV in his room. Shirley was just about to get up and get the remote from her husband so she could put a movie on, but she heard something outside, like a a moaning or a wailing sound. She wasn't sure, but she locked eyes with her husband in that moment. Then, somebody was banging on the front door. Holy shit. So Shirley and her husband run to the door and listen to how smart they are. They left the security lock on and opened it just a crack. The light on the front porch was shining and the McClouds saw Susan crying. They immediately unlocked the chain and opened the door and Susan was yelling, please help me. Now, Shirley didn't know what to do because she wondered, could this be fake? Like, what if the woman is trying to rob them? Uh, So, Susan... It it could even be a situation where she's standing there where the on-sub is off-scene, you know? Uh Uh-huh. And she's just there to get them to open the door. Yeah. And then that gives the other person enough time. I mean, there's so many scenarios it could have been. Well, and that's why I think it's super smart that they just, like, initially left that lock on and tried to assess it first. No, it is. Uh... But Susan continued to cry, and she says, he's got my kids and he's got my car. And Shirley felt like she could hear the terror in her voice. So she was like, okay, get inside. Yeah. She asked Susan to, like, tell me again what happened, what's going on. And Susan said, a black man has got my kids and my car. So Rick yells to his son, and he's like, Rick Jr., call 911. The dispatcher called Union County Deputy Sheriffs, and the call was logged at 9.12 p.m. Once he hung up the phone, he saw his father grab his car keys, and he was like, let's go see if we can find them. So the two men headed out, and Susan announced that she needed to call her mom. So Shirley dialed the number for her, and Susan's older brother said that their mom wasn't home. And Shirley explained Susan's children were kidnapped, and so he was like, okay, I will track her down. I'll figure it out. When she hung up the phone, Susan said that she had to call her stepfather, too. So they did that, and he said he'll get there as soon as possible. They made a third call to Susan's husband, David, and he was also going to head over immediately. As they waited for the police, Susan told Shirley where she lived, 
And she mentioned that her and David had separated a few months ago and were getting a divorce. And then she even told her, she's like, oh, I know this other person with the last name McLeod and asked if they were related. And Shirley's like. She's thinking about that. Yeah. When her kids are supposedly kidnapped. Right. And Um, so. No. That's what Shirley thought, too. She was like, whoa. (laughs) Like, if my kid was taken, all I'd be thinking about is my kid. But, you know. She didn't know what was going on. Right. No, no, of course not. So officers arrived, and this all took place in a matter of minutes. Like, it's a small town. They got there quick. So they arrive at the scene, and Sheriff Wells is uh, just a couple minutes after them, and he immediately contacted the FBI and SLED, which is South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Agents were dispatched to Union, South Carolina, to begin looking for the children right away. Susan's husband, David, showed up and said that Susan was hysterical. Like, he walked in and had to physically pick her up off the floor and set her on a couch. I mean, that would be expected. Oh, absolutely. David called his father to tell him the boys had been kidnapped, and his dad says, She ain't holding a bumper? He told his son that if anybody ever drove off with his kids, he would at least have a piece of that car in his hands. Yep. So even though his father thought something was, like, weird and fishy right away, David never thought that for a second. He believed Susan's story and didn't question her. Well, when it's somebody you care about, why would you? Right. Absolutely. The sheriff eventually announced that they were going to need to move this little operation, you know, and leave the McLeod home. (laughs) Oh, I suppose. <laughs> so, oh, no, I yeah. suppose, because they just, like, took, took over, over their whole house. Uh-huh. When they, oh, no. Yeah, so he's like, you guys, we got to move somewhere. So Susan said, I just want to go to my mom's house then. When they arrived, the photographer for the Union newspaper said he was going to run a picture of the missing kids in the next day's edition. After Kimsey got the photos of the kids, he said he wanted a photo of Susan and David as well. And she goes, well, should I take my glasses off? What? And, well, I'm yeah. I'm, he, no, 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 no. Hold up. She's worried about her fucking glasses uh-huh. and how she looks. Yeah. In this fucking picture. Yeah. When her children are supposedly kidnapped. Correct. Oh. And Kimsey was just Oof. as surprised. Mm, and okay. He was like. Well, you can do whatever makes you comfortable, I guess. See, now you're starting to piss me off with this. Oh, okay. (laughs) Uh, So she pulled her glasses off and sat next to David for the photo. Now, word of the kidnapping spread super fast through this small town, and everybody quickly joined the nine-day search. And at the end of it, people were shocked to learn that everything Susan said was a lie. What? Mm. The way you set that up. (laughs) She appeared to be a very loving mother, but police were discovering some interesting things about her that just weren't adding up. Five days prior to the disappearance of her boys, Susan was talking to a friend of hers and said, I wonder what life would be like if I didn't have kids. Uh Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. Susan and David were, of course, interviewed by the police, which... Yeah, they're the mom and dad. And when Susan gave a description of the man that kidnapped her kids, it was really problematic because it was so generic. She said he was a black male, 30 to 40 years old, 5'9 to 6 feet tall, 175 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes, medium build, wearing a dark cap, dark shirt, jeans, and a plaid jacket. Wowza. So, like, that really narrows it down. Uh Uh-huh. Within days, police had a hunch that something else was going on, but they were in a really tough spot. Two children were missing, and they had to work on finding them, of course, and they were worried about how the community is going to react if they find out Susan lied or if she was accused of such. I suppose. Mm -hmm. David and Susan Smith met with the press on the steps of the Union County Sheriff's Department, and Susan said, quote, I would like to say that whoever has my children, that they please bring them home to us, where they belong. Our lives have been torn apart by the tragic events. I can't express how much they're wanted back home, how much we love them, we miss them. They are our hearts. I have prayed every day. 
There is not one minute that goes by that I don't think about those boys. And I have prayed that whoever has them, that the Lord will let them, let him realize that they are missed and loved more than any children in this world. And that whoever has them, I pray every day that you're taking care of them and know that we would do anything, anything to help you go get them back home to us. I just can't grasp it enough that we've just got to get them home. That's where they belong, with their mama and daddy. David spoke next and said, I would like to take the time to plead to the American public that you please do not give up on these two little boys, the search for their safe return home to us. That you continue to look for the car, our children, and for the suspects themselves, that you continue to keep your eyes open. And anything that you see that might help the police, call and let it be known. We ask that you continue to pray, that the American public continue to pray for Michael and Alex, that they are returned home safely to their mother and father and the family members who love them so much, that you pray most of all for them and that they are being taken care of and that they are safe and they'll return home safely. Now, Susan walked back to the microphone to add the following. Oh, no, she didn't. Uh Uh-huh. She says, quote, I want to say to my babies that your mama loves you so much and your daddy and this whole family loves you so much. And you guys have got to be strong because I just know, I just feel in my heart that you're okay. You've got to take care of yourselves. And your mama and daddy are going to be right here waiting for you when you get home. God, no. I love you so much. (sighs) And then she says. No, she did not. There's no more she's allowed to say. (laughs) She says, I want to tell a story. The night that this happened, before I left my house that night, Michael did something that he's never done before. Uh, I will say she uses a really weird word for a pacifier that I've never heard before, but she calls it a pooper. Oh, what? So she says... No, 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 hold up. (laughs) Did you just... A pooper. Poo-per. Pooper. She, um... (laughs) I don't get it. Is cool with... Poopers in his mouth. Right. That's exactly where I, I was dude, going. And can you imagine like being in the grocery store and being like, oh, your pooper fell out. I've heard a lot. But not a that. lot of names for it. <laughs> but I have never ever heard pooper. <laughs> Please, you guys. If you call it that, I beg you. Let's change it. <laughs> do not do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Please do not put poopers in your children's mouths. I really see some problems here. (laughs) Uh, No poopers in the mouth. Okay. We're learning together. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I don't know if I can recover from this. Well. Okay. Oh, no. (laughs) Okay. So you want to hear the story no, that she has? I um honestly don't, but okay. Well, here it comes. Here we go. <laughs> she says he had his pooper in his mouth, <laughs> and he came up to me and took his pooper out. Stop! <laughs> I should not be laughing at this, but I can't stop. <laughs> and mm-hmm. he put his arms around me and told me, "I love you so much, Mama." He's always told me he loved me, but never, never before, not without telling, not without me telling him first. And that was just, I'm holding on to that so much because it means so much. I love him. I just can't express enough. I have been to the Lord in prayers every day with my family, by myself, with my husband. It just seems so unfair that somebody could take such two beautiful children, and I don't understand. I have put all my trust and faith in the Lord, that he's taking care of them, that he will bring them home to us. Now, investigators watched and listened as Susan made a plea for her children, and they noticed that she just couldn't seem to get those tears flowing. And yes, everybody grieves different, but her voice kept breaking as if there were going to be tears and then nothing happened. Okay. A reporter with WIS-TV in South Carolina, Heather Hoops, was sent to cover the story. Discussions were happening right away about the composite sketch. And Heather said the the sketch was so vague and pretty much described half the people in Columbia. Right. So they had to pull it off the air. Damn. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, that sucks, but it's like, what are you going to do? Right. 
that really does describe a lot of people, and that can create chaos real fast. Yep. Jeannie Boylan is a famous facial identification specialist who immediately saw how problematic the vague sketch was. So she got on a plane and decided she was going to go talk to investigators and Susan to see if she could help. She explained to investigators that a face or image can be stored in a traumatized individual's memory. Oh! Mm hmm. But it's susceptible to change. In the original sketch that was released, it showed a man entering a vehicle, and she said this was actually really inappropriate because the positioning was all wrong, and the man wasn't showing any emotion on his face. If a man oh. is breaking into your car, of course there's going to be some type of emotion. Oh my god. Isn't that crazy? I have never thought about that. Yeah. Of course there's emotion. Yeah. Yeah. And so to have, like, a flat, plain face, that's not going to be helpful. Whoa! Yeah. That's so cool! Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. So when Jeannie got there, she was told that she would have to talk to Susan and David herself, and investigators were not going to force them to do a new sketch. So Jeannie went to their house and was told that she would not be speaking with them. Mark Kloss also showed up in town to help, and he is the father of Polly Kloss, and she was murdered when she was 12. Oh, no. So, like, if anybody could relate to what the family's experiencing, it's him. But he was also turned away. And Mark said, it's so strange. It seems like they're putting Susan ahead of the children's welfare. Like, there's no time to waste. You have to find the kids as quickly as possible. And he felt like they were making all of the wrong moves. Okay. The two of them went to a hotel and Jeannie received a message saying, I'm taking media calls for Susan Smith and Susan's now ready to work with you to develop a character of the abductor. So Jeannie's ecstatic. She's like, oh my God, they changed their mind. So she runs over to the house and apparently was going to help with the caricature that I (laughs) said not correct. She just <laughs> said it really fast the first time, and so it sounded like just character. <laughs> yeah. Caricature. There you go. Uh, so when she arrived, she was told they were no longer interested. Oh, so they made her come yeah. all the way over there for literally nothing. That's nice. And so David's father was really supportive. He wanted them to do a new sketch, and so he's standing out there, and... um. Wait, so there's, like, multiple people involved in this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, are you... Am I getting no, this confused? No, you're... Yeah, you are... No, I, I just got a little bit of stuff because I was like, wait, if they, like, literally are... There's, like, multiple people there, then why yeah. are they... Why is she getting there and they're, like, psych? Yeah, no, they have a whole house full of people. Like, David okay. and Susan were Holy never crap. alone throughout this entire process. Okay. They always had a whole army. So, so basically, they literally called this person and said, we're going to do it. Yeah. They get all the way there, and all those people are waiting. Yep. And then she's just like, nah, never mind. Yeah, and Susan and David during this Holy wouldn't okay. even come out of the house, so they didn't tell her themselves, like, no, we're not going to well, do this. They would send people. David didn't come out either? No. Really? Yeah. Okay. He was staying with Susan. Okay. He was, like, taking care of her. Okay. So, you know, David's father was out there, and he had actually been living in California when Polly Kloss went missing and watched her father on TV pleading for help. Holy crap. So Mark told him, he he was like, I, I have to get in there and see Susan and David. So David's father was really worried. He said, you know, I feel like nobody's fighting for the children at this point. Yeah. And so he was like, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to talk to them. The next morning, Mark showed up early to the house and was told Susan and David were not up to meeting him. And he looks over at David's father and he was like, I thought this was all arranged. Like, what's going on? And David's father like his eyes filled up with tears and he started apologizing and mark ended up leaving that night without ever talking to susan or david damn to even be put in that position of being that person that has to tell them to like after right. everything you just have gone through yeah and then to have to turn them away when it's your like only hope yeah Ugh. and 
Mark said that he, when he left, he was like, I know that Susan is clearly involved in this disappearance, but he felt like maybe she was hiding the kids with somebody and didn't really think that she had hurt them at this point. Ooh. Yeah. But, like, both- I could see that, though. Yeah. I could see why you would think maybe, like, hey, like, you've left them, you know, with somebody specifically. You know where they are. And if I get close, maybe you'll reveal it. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, you've got somebody, like, he works with tons of families because he's been through that same thing. Yeah. And, of course, Jeannie, who does the composite sketches, like, she works with tons of families. And both of them said, we have never been turned away from helping a family. Which, why that would you? first. But, but why yeah. would you? Exactly. That's exactly it. If if your kid is, is truly missing, you are going to do everything. You're going to go to the ends of the earth. Yeah. You're going to do, I mean, if you knew what they looked like, I would be giving every fucking detail and sketch I possibly could. Yeah. And that, that's, a yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So... And, you know, when David's father, like, had watched Mark on TV when he was going through the same thing, you're going to have that connection to him. Yes, absolutely. And they still were like, no, we're Especially not going to do Especially when you this. saw it actually go down. Yeah. I don't like that you're discussing this this much with me because does this mean that this is the end of part one? It sure does. You fucking <laughs> asshole. I knew it. I was like, you are discussing this way too much. I'm not pushing us along. You, you were, <laughs> yep, I knew it. Mm-hmm. Damn. All right. Yeah. So, um, just like to let everyone know where this is going, obviously in part two, we're going to figure out what really happened to yes. the children. Um, we figure out who was involved and... I know the ending is going to suck, but I want to yeah. hear what's... I Like, I want to hear what is ahead of us right now. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then, uh, I even found a surprise little, like, spooky haunted ending to pop in there, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it does take some really weird twists. Okay. Yeah. I like the sound of that. Mm-hmm. Watch TV and take long naps. Wow, you did not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go from a hardworking dad <laughs> to being Mr. Mom. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So on that note. <laughs> Let's shut it down. <laughs> before we keep going. Otherwise, Hannah's going to keep singing country. It's true, and you really don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear me sing in general. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sorry to your car speakers and headphones. All right. So make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, leave us a five-star review. If, if you, you love, love us. us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, bye. bye. You stole my part. I know. It was great.